by mentioning just three specific examples of uh, things the administration has done recently to lead by example. First, the administration's nuclear posture review, or the NPR, uh, changed the U.S. declaratory policy to limit the circumstances under which the United States would use nuclear weapons to defend our nation on the theory that if we appear to devalue these weapons, other states will similarly devalue them and choose not to obtain them. The downside, of course, is that such emphasis on nuclear weapons uh, only reminds states, including rogue regimes, of their value. Second, the central point of the START agreement was a significant drawdown of our nuclear stockpiles, and the administration's already been talking about a next phase that could even include reductions by countries in addition to the United States and Russia. Third example, President Obama wants to commit the United States never again to test nuclear weapons under the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, so that, hopefully, others would follow our example. I'll discuss these three examples uh, in, uh, more in a minute. But obviously, if the theory is wrong, we could be risking a lot. For example, we could be jeopardizing our own security and the nuclear umbrella that assures 31 other countries of their security. Ironically, as our capacity is reduced, their propensity to build their own deterrent is increased, the opposite of what we intend. We could also be sacrificing our freedom to deploy full range of missile defenses that we need to, um, by agreeing to arms control agreements like START or other agreements or unilateral actions, like the United States statement on missile defense which accompanied the START treaty. On the CTBT, were we to ratify that, we would of course forever legally give up our right to test weapons, and that's a very serious limitation. The point is, by leading by example, uh, we entail uh, sacrifices that could have significant consequences. And the question is whether the risks are justified. Now, what does President Obama want to achieve with this strategy? Well, first of all, as you know, he has long advocated a zero nuclear weapons policy, going all the way back to his writings as a college student in 1983. In fact, then he wrote that the drive to achieve a ban on all nuclear weapons testing would be a powerful first step toward a nuclear-free world. He's even cast it in moral terms, saying that as a nuclear power, as the only nuclear power to have used a nuclear weapon, the United States has a moral responsibility to act. Well, I think there are four big assumptions here. First, that the global zero idea, a world without nuclear weapons, is necessarily a good thing. Second, that such a world could be realistically achieved. Third, that our leadership here will help reestablish previously lost moral force behind U.S. policy. And finally, uh, if we lead, others will follow. I think the first three assumptions need to be carefully examined, though this morning I'm only going to focus on the last. Suffice it to say the following about the first three assumptions. First, is zero really desirable? Well, if nuclear deterrence has kept the peace between superpowers since the end of World War II, which itself cost over 60 million lives, according to some estimates, are nuclear weapons really a risk to peace or a contributor to peace? Second, the know-how exists to build nuclear weapons, and they can't be disinvented. So is it really realistic to think that they can be effectively eliminated. For example, if we get near to zero, any nation that can break out and build a few nuclear weapons could become a superpower. And the superpowers themselves will find it difficult to get close to zero. For example, if Russia deploys an extra 10 weapons today, it's not a big deal. We have 2,200 deployed. But if each side only had 100 weapons and one side adds an extra 10, then that's a significant military breakout. And while we will have deployed 1,550 uh, weapons under the new treaty, the United, er, excuse me, China will still only have several hundred. But as we go lower, China would have an incentive to build up quickly and become a peer competitor to the United States. So how do we deal with those problems? It's not clear that we know. The third assumption, do we really have to restore our moral leadership is the question I would ask. Is it necessary? Uh, or necessarily, I should say, more moral, or even moral at all, to eschew weapons that have been a deterrent to conflict, but the elimination of which could make the world again safe for
for conventional wars between superpowers. Again, World War II cost an estimated 60 million lives, but after 1945, the great powers have been deterred from war with each other. These three questions, as I said, deserve full debate, but it is the last assumption that I want to explore today, that if we lead, others will follow. Put another way, is the world just waiting for the United States to further eliminate nuclear weapons? It's true that if we lead, uh, or I should say, is it true that uh, we could, for example, eliminate nuclear weapons? And does our credibility in the world depend upon us taking these actions? Well, the President outlined his vision of this in an interview with the New York Times last year, and I wanted to quote from it. He said, it is naive for us to think that we can grow our nuclear stockpiles. The Russians continue to grow their nuclear stockpiles and our allies grow their nuclear stockpiles, and that in that environment we're going to be able to pressure countries like Iran and North Korea not to pursue nuclear weapons themselves. The first problem <clears throat> with this statement is that it's factually wrong. We are not growing our nuclear stockpiles. In fact, we're reducing them and have been reducing them for years. The second problem is that notwithstanding our reductions, others are not following suit. One of the first places that President Obama has chosen to lead in this issue uh, was to modify our approach to the use of nuclear weapons in the Nuclear Posture Review. I previously mentioned his new policy of non-use against certain kinds of non-nuclear attacks. A second feature of the NPR was to artificially take off the table some necessary options like replacement of nuclear components to make them more reliable and safe. This leading by example, uh, I, I should say it is leading by example, but um, other nuclear powers aren't following, first of all, and secondly, I don't think we should be doing it if we want to ensure that our weapons will do what we want them to do. The administration's next step, of course, was signing the START agreement. It's a treaty with significant reductions to our deployed warheads and delivery vehicles, but it also has potentials for limitations on our missile defense. Um, was Russia going to reduce the numbers of its weapons with or without the treaty? Uh, I, I think that they were, and therefore one cannot conclude that they did it because we led by example. And it remains to be seen whether what we gave up will be worth the ostensible reset in our relations with the Russians. And after the new start, there's another arms control treaty. I mentioned it, and let me in this context quote Assistant Secretary of State Rose Gottmuller, who did the negotiating on the start treaty. She gave a speech called The Long Road from Prague and said this, the second major arms control objective of the Obama administration is the ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. There is no step that we could take that would more effectively restore our moral leadership and improve our ability to re-energize the international non-proliferation consensus than to ratify the CTBT. Of course, there are several assumptions in that statement. Is it true that we've acted badly and we must atone to restore our moral leadership? Let me just recount some of the things we've done in disarmament already. The U.S. has reduced its nuclear weapon stockpile by 70 percent since the end of the Cold War and 90 percent since the height of the Cold War, and this doesn't even include the new START figures. The U.S. has not conducted nuclear weapons tests since 1992. We haven't designed a new warhead since the 80s, nor have we built one since the 1990s. We've pulled back almost all of our tactical weapons. And in the new NPR, we will retire our sea-launched cruise missile. What has this leadership gotten us? Has it impressed Iran or North Korea? Has it kept Russia and China and France and Great Britain and India and Pakistan from modernizing and in some cases growing their nuclear weapon stockpile? Russia is, in fact, deploying a new multi-purpose attack submarine that can launch long-range cruise missiles with nuclear warheads against land targets at a range of 5,000 kilometers, just barely missing the threshold to be considered a strategic weapon under the New START Treaty. Of course, a tactical nuclear weapon has a strategic effect if it's detonated above a city in the United States or one of our allies. Will Pakistan or North Korea ratify the CTBT uh, just because the United States does. I don't think that's likely. In fact, both nations continued their nuclear weapons tests after the United States unilaterally, unilaterally stopped testing 
and even after the United States signed the CTBT? Well, have these steps motivated our allies to be more helpful in dealing with real threats like Iran and North Korea and with nuclear terrorism? If we ratify the CTBT, would Great Britain suddenly have a new motivation to help us more than they have, for example, in dealing with Iran? If we cut more nuclear weapons from our stockpile, would France now be willing to cut back on its force to frap? The answer to that is no. Was Russia willing to discuss its tactical nuclear weapons as part of the current START treaty? Russia's president has said that possessing nuclear weapons is crucial to pursuing independent policies and to safeguarding sovereignty. In fact, Russia appears to be as difficult as ever in announcing that it will build a new nuclear reactor in Syria on the very same day that the United States announced that it will begin nuclear cooperation with Russia. Has all of our work toward disarmament impressed Turkey to play a constructive or obstructionist role in reigning in Iran? The recent nuclear security summit saw no meaningful new commitment because of our newfound moral leadership. In fact, the most the administration could say for it is that 47 nations signed a non-binding communique. And with regard to the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review concert, which, uh, Conference, which is underway as we speak in New York, will our moral leadership bring us any benefit there? It's not encouraging to see the conference devolve into a discussion of Israel's nuclear weapons as opposed to a discussion of Iran's effort to acquire nuclear weapons. When countries have cut back their nuclear weapon program, we see it's for reasons uh, that have to do with their own security interests or economic requirements. Nations, with the exception of the United States, it seems, take actions that they perceive to be in their best interests. They do not change their national security posture merely because of the United States disarmament. They may even observe those steps as weaknesses and opt to double down on their aggressive outlaw actions as a result. For example, Russia agreed to the limits in the New START Treaty, but as I noted, it was only because it was already going to go down to those levels, not because of any U.S. moral leadership on the issue. Nor did South Africa abandon its nuclear weapon program because of our leadership. It was because of the fall of the apartheid regime. Did Libya end its program because we opted not to go ahead with the uh, earth penetrator or the uh, reliable replacement warhead? No. Libya saw 160,000 U.S. troops in Iraq enforcing U.N. Security Council's resolution on nuclear proliferation and feared it could be next. These same interests, security and commercial, also dictate nations' actions with regard to the nuclear terrorism and non-proliferation issues. For example, Russia says that an Iran with nuclear weapons is a threat. And it will go along with some sanctions. For example, sanctions that raise the global price of energy, of which Russia is the world's leading exporter. But it won't go along with sanctions cutting off Iran's flow of weapons, which Russia sells in great quantity. And I note with interest that there is some ambiguity in the new proposed UN resolutions with respect to these kinds of sanctions. It will be interesting to see how Russia interprets those. Even a country like Germany would like the United States to remove from that country the tactical nuclear weapons that we deploy there for uh, NATO's defense, but at the same time is actually growing its economic links to Iran, and it appears willing only to impose sanctions agreed to by the United Nations and the European Union. The bottom line is there is no evidence our moral leadership in arms control and disarmament will convince countries to set aside their calculations of the impact of nuclear proliferation and nuclear terrorism on their national security and help us address those threats. So here's what I conclude. The administration's security agenda is based on the notion of the United States making sub substantive changes to our national security posture in the <coughs> hopes of persuading others to act, frequently contra in, uh, contrary to their economic and security interests. But this good faith assumption that others will reciprocate I don't think is supported by evidence. It's certainly not informed by any past experience. Before big changes are made to our security posture, I believe the President owes it to the American people to explain exactly how the changes will improve our security. It cannot just be a matter of change and hope. Too much is at stake. I also think the American people will be quite surprised to learn that their nation lost its moral leadership somewhere 
and that concessions to their security are now necessary to reestablish it. As a complete aside, the most recent example of the Obama administration's thinking in this regard is the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy and Human Rights comparison of the immigration law passed by my state of Arizona to the systemic policy of abuse and repression by the People's Republic of China. As you can tell by now, I'm not much impressed with the notion that we can achieve important U.S. security goals by leadership, which stresses concessions by the United States. Rather than change and hope, I adhere to the philosophy of President Reagan, epitomized in the words peace through strength. A strong America is the best guarantor of a peaceful world that has ever been known, and there is nothing immoral about strength that keeps the peace. If I could make a comment, uh, Senator, on this moral leadership issue, there is a high correlation between respect for moral leadership and success. I can remember, only a few people can remember, the fall of France in 1940, at which point a question rose that the, whether Nazi Germany showed moral characteristics, one of the few regimes that certainly did not. When the Shah fell and Khomeini replaced him, suddenly there was this burst of enthusiasm for Khomeini, uh, which was unwarranted. So we sometimes confuse what is success with moral leadership, and the inverse is true. If we fail, we are certainly to be condemned for lack of moral leadership, as happened in uh, uh, Vietnam. I've got a question. Yesterday, I said to this group that with until the Russians move on their tactical nuclear weapon stockpile, which they admit to be 3,800, uh, we are not in a position to lower any further our own strategic stockpile. And since the Russians have shown no indication that they will reduce their tactical nuclear weapons stockpile, I said, les majeste, that the Senate of the United States, whatever its composition, is not going to approve the follow-on start that some people hope for your comment. Well, you've certainly pointed to one of the key deficiencies in the treaty, including one of the biggest lost opportunities. My, my view, let me just set the stage a little bit before I specifically answer. Uh, the United States uh, had, in my view, almost nothing to gain from this treaty unless we had decided to use it as a way to continue the verification provisions of the old treaty, but we did not do that. We dropped that, those verification provisions before the negotiations even started, or to use the negotiations as a way to deal with the tactical nuclear weapon issues of the Russians. They said they didn't want to talk about it, so we agreed not to talk about that. With those two off the table, what was there left for the United States to gain from this treaty? Well, piecing together my own analysis and what the administration has said, by making concessions to the Russians, they might be in a more cooperative mode uh, to work with us on issues of mutual or at least of, of interest to us. And that's what I was getting at here. It remains to be seen. Um, they were going down to their numbers anyway, so we didn't have to have a treaty to get them to do that. The treaty limits us. We have to go down to 700 deployable uh, launchers. That's a level below which a lot of commentators that are experts in the area believe is advisable. And now more to your point, there is no bright line distinction between a tactical and strategic weapon, as I inferred from my comment about the 
5,000-kilometer cruise missile. Um, the Russians intend to use tactical nuclear weapons in battlefield conditions if it's required uh, for their national security. And you can have very large tactical weapons and very small yield precise strategic weapons that are basically indistinguishable except perhaps by the range uh, from which uh, they're delivered. So it seemed to me that this was something that we should have addressed in the treaty. We didn't. Instead, we made concessions which appear to me to make it almost impossible for us to have any strong negotiating leverage next time we try to deal with this subject and presumably deal with the question of tactical nukes. So it's plain as day what the quid pro quo is going to be next time, missile defense for tactical nukes. And even in the area of missile defense, I would argue that we have already made some concessions in this treaty, at least making it clear that we're, we've stepped out on the slippery slope. Uh, the administration likes to say, I'm just going to expand on this just a tad. The administration likes to say, we made no concessions uh, in missile defense. Well, yes, it did. Article 5 said we're not going to use any offensive uh, tubes or, or missiles to convert those to defensive mode. We've already done that at Vandenberg. We converted, uh, or converted five silos that were offensive, Minuteman silos, to, defensive, to our defensive system. Uh, it can and we decided should be done in that case. But the administration covers itself by saying, well, we have no more intention to do that. Therefore, we're not limited. Well, if you, if you sign a document that's binding on the country for 10 years beyond the, the term of the Barack, Barack Obama administration, you've limited what we can do with missile defense. Now, it might or might not be a good idea to do that, but you can't say it hasn't been limited. But I think that's the least of the issues. The preamble now includes the word current in in comparing the defensive and strategic offensive systems. And the Russians have said what they interpret that to mean is that they can leave the treaty if the United States does anything with our missile defense to create an imbalance be that between the offensive and defense that exists today. That, I think, will be a very difficult proposition for President Obama to deal with. If the, if the Russians believe that we're doing something they don't like and they tell him we're going to leave the treaty, do you think that President Obama is going to do somersaults to try to stay in the treaty and pull his punches with respect to missile defense. I think there's a credible case to be made that he would do that. And the evidence of that is the third point. Our response to the Russian unilateral statement was a unilateral statement of our own that specifically limits our missile defense. What the administration said was, in a reassurance to the Russians, we have no a plan for missile defense that would go beyond a limited attack capability. That is a huge pullback from what missile defense has always been, which is a potential to defend against, for example, an ICBM from the Soviet Union in the past, from Russia today, from China, an accidental launch from one of those countries, for example. It doesn't have to be launched in anger. And um, the administration has to, has to define now whether or not its so-called phase four in the missile defense program is, um, is really extant or not, given the fact that it would have that kind of capability. But we've now said unilaterally, no, we're only going to limit it to, to limited attacks. So we have cut back on our missile defense plans, at least the, the administration has. So all of this is, I think, a way of saying that um, we have limited ourselves in this treaty in a way that makes it clear to me that the Russians are going to require us to make substantial concessions in missile defense and potentially other areas like conventional global strike before they're going to deal with their tactical nukes. And even then, I'm not sure they will. Will all of this be sufficient to cause senators to vote against the treaty? I don't know. You have responsible senators with a background in this area already announcing that they support the treaty, notwithstanding some of the things that I've just said. Um, to their credit, they've also said, however, that it still depends upon the modernization program, which was submitted at the same time the treaty was sent up to the Senate. And that modernization program is an entirely different proposition. In my view, it's, um, one can at least uh, argue that it is not adequate. And my own calculus here that is without an adequate and, in fact, robust modernization plan, uh, it would not be a good idea to ratify the START Treaty. But I think it's premature to make a judgment about whether it will or won't be ratified for that reason, um, among other things. And, and I, I would also suggest this to members who have 
come out in favor of the treaty. It is important, I think, to review the record of negotiations. Were there any side agreements or at least implied uh, agreements in the negotiations? The Russians in an open press have certainly said that there were. Um, we'll see when we read the uh, negotiation record. We don't have the NIE yet from the intelligence community on the verification or the State Department uh, response to that. We don't have the compliance reports from the State Department that they promised to send to us. So there's a lot that we, we haven't even received yet to evaluate, uh, let alone to make a judgment on the treaty. So I'm going to answer the question by saying too early to tell. Sorry for a really long answer. It's eight minutes of nine. And uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions before 9 o'clock. Sir. Uh, Todd Jacobson with Nuclear Weapons and Materials Monitor. You mentioned uh, just a few moments ago that the modernization plan was not adequate. Um, I'm assuming you mean for the NNSA and for the delivery uh, systems. Could you expound on that a little bit? And what do you mean? In, in what ways is it not <clears throat> adequate? Yeah, I said one could argue that it is not. Um, there are, there are two primary problems and a third. We, we don't yet know what the force structure is. Ordinarily, you would, you would design the force structure before you made concessions in a treaty which um, would work with the force structure that you determined necessary. It appears to me that we're doing that the other way around. The Senate has not yet been advised of uh, what our, forces, our triad is going to look like in the future, except there is a commitment in the modernization program to the submarine uh, to, to a new submarine program, which is, which is uh, very useful. Um, but the, the two primary concerns are, um, first of all, the funding for this program, which most of the people I've talked to seem to believe um, above and beyond the stockpile stewardship and other activities at the national labs will require on the order of 13 billion, maybe a little more, over a 10-year period of time. I don't see that increase in funding accommodated in the budget or in the modernization program that's been submitted. Depending upon what rate of inflation you use, um, the money that is in the, in the plan, they, they, they talk about a $180 billion plan. Well, 100 of that is basically for our weapons systems, and the 80 is, is double counting. Uh, most of that is already in the 10-year budget. It's what we were going to spend on the labs times inflation. And uh, there's very little, I think it's about four, four to six billion left over for the modernization program, maybe half as much as I think is actually going to be required. Indeed, the administration only accounts for $4.6 billion, and that money was transferred or would be transferred. It's, it's not even money, it's authority, spending authority from the Department of Defense over to the Department of Energy. So I see nothing in the budget itself that is new money for this modernization program. And I think before the Senate ratifies the treaty, we should have an assurance that the administration is committed over a long time, a uh, long period of time, to funding the program to the necessary extent. There's even a question as to how we're going to get funding for next year's budget, since it appears we may not do an appropriation bill. And it could be that the beginning of the fiscal year on October 1st will come and go without any appropriated amount of the 600 plus billion dollars that they've committed for this next year for the modernization program. So money is a real problem. And secondly, as I alluded to in my comments, in the NPR, the administration made it very clear that it would not favor replacement uh, of uh, nuclear uh, components, but would instead uh, rely on reuse or refurbishment. And that if the labs wanted to recommend replacement, they would effectively have to establish um, they, they would have to meet a burden of proof that there was no other choice that could meet the requirements. Well, that's an impossible burden. No other choice? I suppose if you had a million years and you had an unlimited amount of money, you can always figure out some other option. But obviously, uh, you have to consider the circumstances, the time and the, and the, uh, the money that it costs and a whole lot of other requirements uh, and others in order to evaluate whether something is the right choice or not. And I, I had hoped that the administration in the modernization plan would clarify that NPR limitation to a greater extent than it has. It obviously recognized the problem because there is a sentence in there that I suspect is an attempt to clarify it. Uh, I think it's problematic as to whether it does or not. And the point here is that we've got a lot of very great scientists working. Are they going to be chilled in the work they do? Basically being told you can work on new designs if you want to, but 
it's not going to be a, a career advancement deal because uh, the, uh, the deck is stacked against anything like that ever being accepted by the president, who, after all, has to be the last one to sign off on any new change here. So I think those are some questions about the modernization plan that we're going to have to deal with, and uh, they'll have to be fleshed out. Obviously, the plan was a, or I shouldn't say obviously, it was a classified plan. And until people really read it, it's kind of like the Arizona immigration law, you know, a lot of comment about it, but nobody's read it. So let's read it, let's debate it, discuss it, and see whether or not we believe it's adequate. When you're going to reduce the numbers down to the levels we have in the START Treaty, you've got to know that what we have left works, is safe, uh, and is reliable. Ambassador Solomon. And I will make this very short since I'm going to have to run. Senator, I'll make it uh, short. Dick Solomon, the Institute of Peace. The discussions here and uh, today and yesterday, your presentation, all highlight the fact that the global counterproliferation regime is very shaky, if, if not ineffectual. Let's assume that uh, economic and political uh, measures fail to stop Iran from proliferating. Do you think at that point the, uh, the American political system would support the United States taking forceful action to draw a red line and try to impose a discipline that, unfortunately, the UN Security Council, the international system, doesn't seem to be able to establish to prevent global proliferation? Well, and you're specifically speaking of Iran? Yeah, I, I don't know what that red line would be under the circumstances. It may be too late even for more robust sanctions to work. I mean, there is only a, one other alternative, and I would have thought that people who wanted to avoid a military alternative would have been more, more supportive of the kind of sanctions that might have uh, prevented Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. But I don't, I don't know of anything else that the United States could do uh, that would receive support by the administration, let alone the American people, in terms of sanctions. I think the American people would go along with, with pretty much uh, whatever the Congress and the President wanted to do. But uh, I don't see the, uh, the will of this administration to do anything more than relatively uh, uh, weak sanctions. And, and I know they're having a hard time with the allies and with Russia and China, but all of that was supposed to be solved by leading by example. Call crippling sanctions. Yes, Senator. crippling sanctions. I want to thank all of you again for your patience here, and uh, Dr. Schlesinger and Dimitri, thank you very much.